He's Henry Gomez, an ad agency strategist with 25 years of experience. And he's Howard Eibach, a former copywriter and creative director and the author of two books on the creative brief. And together we're the Brief Brothers, having an ongoing discussion about creative briefs, briefing, and advertising. So Howard, today we're back with another episode of the Brief Brothers. And for today's episode, we thought we'd do something, I think it's gonna be fun. Um, I saw a LinkedIn post by Vivek Kuchibotla, our very first guest on the Brief Brothers. And his post was a link to BBH's website and their blog. And it was a specific post by Chaz Wigley. And Chaz Wigley is their head of BBH Asia. And it was, the post was 100 uh, lessons he has learned over his career as an advertising planner. So I love these listicles because it gives you a lot of stuff to react to. And we thought it would be a good topic to go over some of our favorites and kind of either agree, disagree. Uh, I think there's not a lot to disagree with, but certainly to give our perspective on, on how true these things are and, and what is our, our experience has been. And I think it's also a great opportunity for us to post a link for other, for our um, 12 or 13 viewers to, to, uh, to dive into it's great uh, information, whether you're a, a newbie or you've been around for 30 years. Yeah, I, I always think that going back and and even if there are things that you already knew, um, seeing them articulated by someone else um, can usually be eye opening. Again, it's 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 easy to forget um, yeah. lessons that in, in this business. So, so kick I, us off, kick us off, uh, Henry. What's your first favorite or least favorite? Uh, um. Number nine, uh, don't be too fast to criticize. It's little bits of somebody up there on that wall. And um, as a strategist, I have always tried to keep that in mind. You know, we I get called into a meeting um, to look at ideas that creative teams came up with, um, usually based on a brief I gave them, right? <laughs> and uh, I have to have a light touch, you know? And when I like something, uh, or think something is good, I explain why I think it's good. If there's something that I don't think is so good, I usually don't even bring it up, um, which is something that I've found works pretty well. Focus on on the positives. I remember one anecdote when I was working at an agency oof, 13, 14 years ago. Um, the account was being transitioned from a strategist who was handling it temporarily to me who was going to be the permanent strategist on it. And we evaluated like 20 ideas. And out of 20 ideas, you could imagine they weren't all great. And after the meeting, um, the other strategist said, oh God, some of that stuff was garbage. And I said, yeah, but why do you focus on that? We're only ever going to present two or three. Um, and there were two or three really good ideas there. So let's focus on the positive. Really, really good point. You know, I do a, a workshop on, you know, mastering an effective creative review. And one of the first things I talk about is avoiding words like I think or, or in my opinion and staying away from that and focusing instead on asking questions like what? Why do you like this idea? Where did this idea come from? How would you defend this? How would you scale this? Talk about the the origins of the idea so you get a sense of what the creative or the creative team was thinking. So, yeah. Creative critiques are, are important. We have to, We, as a former creative, I understand your work is going to be critiqued. There's a difference between critique and criticism, and we want critique, not, you know, because we're supposed to have thick skin, but it's still us up on that wall. It's a piece of us. That's a really good point. Yeah, and, and I would say, I had in my experience, you know, artistic types are usually people that don't necessarily have thick skin. Um, yeah. And we have to be sensitive to that, you know. I, I like to say that as a strategist, I have to walk the two worlds, right? That business world, our account team and the client is on and the creative world where, you know, these right brain people operate. And um, it, it, it's not a put down to say they're sensitive people. I mean, that's a lot of times where they get their creativity from. So um, I think we have to recognize that and tread lightly. Yeah, yeah, good point. Okay, my my uh, one of my favorites is 
Dull words and clever thinking are far more useful than clever words and dull thinking. And then he adds a caveat here. Thank you, Dave Trott. And, and I would say, you know, just about anything that comes from the fertile brain of Dave Trott is going to be interesting to me and to you, too. I know we've talked about this before. And say it usually, again? It's usually funny, too. Yes, usually funny. So here it is. Clever, clever words versus clever thinking. You know, dull words versus clever thinking, dull thinking versus clever words. I want clever thinking. And that's that's the you know, that's the bottom line for you and me, Henry. The creative brief is supposed to articulate in as few but as powerful words as possible what it is that we're trying to reach to to achieve. So I want clever thinking. Uh, clever words are often a mask for no thinking at all or a or, or a shield or something to hide behind. So I, I love this. Clever thinking is what we're going for. That's what a good creative brief is all about. Yeah, I talk about internally, you know, we want our strategies to be sound. We want the creative to be extraordinary. This, this, <laughs> the strategy shouldn't be extraordinary. It should be sound, something that you build uh, something on top of the ideas are supposed to be what's extraordinary. You know, I, I wasn't, I didn't pick this one, but it just, your comment here just sparked a re recollection of one of these 100 ideas. And I'm going to get it. I'm going to paraphrase because I'm not sure I got it exactly. But he, he, he essentially said a planner has to recognize that a strategy is a starting point and that if something else comes along that shows the strategy isn't quite, quite right, Disregard the strategy, and you've said that at least a couple of times in our, in, in our past conversations. If the strategy you, um, that emerges from the brief or or from before the brief produces something that you didn't expect, toss out the strategy and think about the brilliance of the idea instead. So I, I think he mentions that somewhere. I just remember which one it was. Yeah, I I think the, if you ladder that up, it's don't be dogmatic, right? Like yeah, as a strategist, the worst thing you could do is be dogmatic about the strategy. Um, particularly in the light of better thinking and, and creativity is an iterative organic process and you don't know where it's going to lead and it could lead to some really phenomenal uh, thinking and insights if you allow it to. Um, your enemy there would be that that dogmatism. And that's the and that's the point to take away from this because it's your initial strategy that sparked the idea in the first place, even if it doesn't truly reflect that strategy. So don't feel like you've been you know, disregarded or bested, you helped spark the idea to begin with. So look at it that way. Yep. Um, so my next one, it's actually two that are, I think are related is number 20 agencies are perfectly capable of doing ads without you. It's salutatory not to forget that. And then number 22, you are not the only one who can contribute to strategy. So I think they're related, and and this is another one that over the last six months I've I've articulated hopefully, in a good way um, about being humble as a strategist. Um, our job is to assist. Um, I believe our creatives are capable of home runs. Uh, my objective is to optimize a process so that they waste less time, um, they have less heartache by helping lead them um, in a in a more constructive route um, to territories that are going to be more fertile. But certainly, um, you know, there are creatives that are very strategic. There are account people that are very strategic. So we have to keep our, our mind open to feedback and to your point, you know, collaboration. Like, I, I don't think any strategist or brief writer can write a brief in a vacuum. You have to get a different perspective, whether that be coming from the account team or from the creative team, or even from somebody, you know, just walking down the street. Sometimes it's 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 good to to get an outside perspective because it's easy to get in your own bubble of thinking. Yeah, really good point. You know, I think the the, the what I take away from those two points is remember to be humble. You know, this is a team effort. We we are all recruited and brought into the agency world or the client world for our individual expertise, but we're part of a bigger thing and we have to remember how that all works together. And to your point about account people being strategic, his 101st point, which was kind of a you know acknowledgement who of all those who helped him, he said, if there's a number 101, it's gonna be I I'm grateful over my career for some really smart, good account people. 
So my next one is number 13, and that tells you that I'm not superstitious. It says, to understand people, you need to see the world through their eyes. That means empathizing with them. That's your job. Now, he's talking about planners. I'm reading that as planners and account people and creatives and clients, everybody whose job it is to sell in our product. And, you know, I also like to say the creative brief uh, speaks for the customer. It doesn't speak for the brand. Right? The brand is obviously what we're trying to sell, but the creative brief itself is designed to, to, to think on behalf of and speak on behalf of and speak for, sometimes even as, our customer. So we have to remember to, to get out of our heads, to get out of our cubicles, to get out into the world and remember to, to hear what people are saying, but also simply to observe. Because what we see customers doing is probably far more reliable than what they'll tell us in a focus group or a, or email or a survey, because that, that's where they, they put their, their wallet to work when they are doing something. So empathizing with people, understanding them, that's really big, huge. Yeah, this is another one that that we've touched on, right? We I talked about that target description in the brief as almost being the description of a costume that you want the creatives to put on, right? So where they can feel and think like the target consumer or at least have that perspective in their mind um, and not their own, you know, they, they certainly there's a role for their own perspective. Each creative is going to internalize a brief differently and therefore the work that they spit out of that process uh, what whatever that you know ideation process is going to be different and shaped by their own experiences but we our job in that target description especially is to give them a little bit of that what does the consumer think is important and we have to empathize with it even if we're, we're never in a million years going to be the target audience right um, and we normally are are not the target audience right so um the, this uh, uh, next one was uh, number 23 and number 24. I think they're both linked. And uh, 23 is don't ever say this brief is about starting a movement. You will look like a fool for vastly overestimating the power of what we do. And I have to admit, I've done this before, um, you know, and I think part of that humility is admitting when you've made mistakes, right? Um, at, but the 24 is related, which is everyone has access to the same consumers but not the same brand. And I think that those really go together because you know there are certain brands that you could say are about a movement, right? Like Harley Davidson or something like that, but those brands are so few and far between. Um, you know, if you're selling breakfast cereal, you're probably not gonna start a movement. You know, if you're selling maxi pads, you're probably not gonna start a movement. So let's be humble about the the, the role of advertising and the role of, of, of brands. Not everything is Apple, not everything is Harley Davidson, not everything is Nike. And it's important to remember our, our role in that. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I have anything to add to that. That's that's really well said. Um, and my my third, and, and there are a hundred things on this list and you know it's hard to pick just three. And I think we're, we're gonna come back to this and you know, continue picking out nuggets for a, an a, for an additional episode. But my third is number 16, involve your clients early in the process and frequently. If they've been involved, they are far more likely to buy. And this is a scary thing. I've done this before where I brought in a, a director level client and actually had him sit in on a, with my creative department as we just started an initial round of brainstorming. It wasn't individual team member or, or teams working individually. It was the whole department, which is not something that we did very often, but I wanted to give the client an opportunity to just, you know, sit in and hear what we were doing. And I think it intimidated the hell out of him because he didn't say a word. He just sat there and listened. And we were all encouraging him to say, just, you know, jump in with anything. We want to know your perspective. I like this idea because it also gets back to what we've talked about before and you and I have disagreed with which is the collaboration on writing the brief. You know, you have your perspective on, uh, you want to have that independence to write your own brief. And I say, well, I think a single brief written by both sides together in one sitting is has some value. And I think that's what I take away from this particular uh, piece of advice. I like that thinking, get the client involved, make, make them feel like they have skin in the game. I mean, they clearly they do, they're gonna write the check and they're gonna approve what we do. 
But if we get them involved in the actual process, they feel part of the whole game. And that's, I think, beneficial. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to beat a dead horse. I, I think <laughs> that certainly the agency and the client need to agree to a brief, whether the agency goes on and kind of refines that brief for creatives. Um, I think we have a disagreement on, on that. Um, but um, certainly, uh, clients should be striving to all be on the same page um, when they brief an agency um, so that there isn't a disconnect later um, when presenting work because different stakeholders have different criteria. So we're, I think we're going to agree to disagree at, at a certain level, but we do agree on a certain level. And your final, your final I tidbit. My final tidbit, and I actually wrote a piece on LinkedIn about this. It's number 27. Pre-testing work is a conservative fool's paradise. Most Australians hated the Sydney Opera House when it was built. A carbuncle on the harbor. Now it's on their stamp. So um, I, I, I believe, you know, I, the analogy I give is uh, all in the family, right? Like if we did the kind of focus group dial testing today that, you know, uh, or if we did it back then that we do today, um, I could imagine them saying, you know, why is that Archie character so, so mean? Can't you make him nicer? And it would have completely destroyed the whole show. So sometimes, um, you know, asking people to rationalize artistic work isn't the best, actually a lot of times, isn't the best uh, formula for success. You know, advertising is supposed to hit you at a gut level and you don't always know exactly how it works. Just ask Paul Feldwick. So um, yeah. this this one about pre-testing is one that I definitely agree with. I agree with it, too, but I take the word pre off of that and believe, I believe strongly in testing. I, I spent a good chunk of my career in direct response. And of course, we would always test. We do A-B splits, sometimes more to find out what is the best creative, what is the best, what are the best devices that draw in more uh, responses, click-throughs, phone calls, visits, whatever it might be. So testing is different from pre-testing because we have two different sets of ideas. It could be different creative, different lists, different offers, but it's not giving it a world before we put it out in the market. It's putting out two ideas into the marketing, seeing what, seeing what happens. So that's it is an entirely different beast, but I'm agreeing with your point of view. Pre-testing is, is a fool's errand for fool's paradise, but I do believe in testing. I do. I agree with you. And I've worked on accounts where we had significant uh, uh, direct response uh, investments. And certainly that is something that has always been around and will continue to be around. And by the way, today, I think more than ever important because we're now able to identify consumers and and, you know, it, it's not just pumping ads out into a mass um, medium, but we actually can get, measure responses. It's not for everybody. It's not for every brand or product, but certainly there's a role for for uh, for testing of creative in market, uh, particularly in the direct response arena. Good stuff, Henry. We've got lots more that we didn't cover, so we'll come back to this one, but good start. Awesome. All right, Henry, we're going to do our creative review today by taking a look at a short spot, a 15 second spot uh, produced by Energy BBDO in Chicago for Philips Milk of Magnesia. This will uh, this will get you. Take a look at this. All is right in Sarah's world. Thanks to the naturally sourced magnesium in Philips laxatives, she's able to enjoy a gentle poop in as little as 30 minutes. Phillips, you deserve a good poop. Okay, we're back. I have some definite thoughts on this, but I'm going to pass it on to you, no pun intended. What do you think? Um, I didn't hate it. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, this is a, a sensitive topic, right? And one that a lot of people have to deal with, you know, is uh, constipation. And I think the fresh approach, I don't think that it's um, particularly a gross approach, right? They're, but they're kind of saying, you know, sometimes you deserve a good poop. And um, the, 
the the woman is obviously feeling um, relieved in the commercial. You know, I, I I noticed a couple of words like naturally sourced magnesium. It sounds like something that people probably want to hear is like where where do you get this magnesium from? Uh, and uh, but all in all, you know, I think it's um I think it's clever in not not beating around the bush. The 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 the, the benefit of, of the product is there. And I think the key word in, in kind of this quiet approach that they have with this woman is gentle. Um, because um, certainly the fear would be to take something that would result in a not so gentle bowel movement. Um, so in a lot of ways, there's things that are unsaid here that are just as powerful as what is said. Well, Henry, you old poop. I have an alternative view on this one. <laughs> uh, I was reading the copy that accompanied the article in Ad Age about this spot, which is pretty brand new. And you know, the thing, one of the things that, that was entertaining is the fact that CBS, the network CBS, apparently has assured them that you can say poop on TV, which is pretty scary. If that, if that word is potentially uh, in violation of some someone's sensibilities, we haven't come very far. But one of the things they're saying in the copy is that we're trying to to go after honesty here. This is what people face every day. Let's not have any shame around it. And my take on this is that this is just for shock value. Once we hear the word poop, it's like, oh my God, did they say poop? Did they really say poop? The benefit of this is what you see on her face. And they never talk about the benefit. They only talk about what all laxatives do, which is, you know, allow you to have a gentle poop. So I think there's a little bit of, uh, this is disingenuous. And I think this is more of shock value than, than anything else. Yeah, it's clever. I love the fact they're just calling it what it is. But this is a category leader. I think it's a category leader. And I think it's a category ad. And we've discussed this before. A category leader doing a category ad is not necessarily a bad thing because Who's this going to benefit most? The category leader. But they certainly didn't do anything to talk about why this is such a good product and this better than anybody else's. So I give them credit for the so-called honesty, but I think it's more shock value than anything else. That's my take. You know, uh, there's variety is the spice of life, I guess. And if you <laughs> eat too much spicy food, you're going to end up on the can. Uh, but... Uh, you know, I, I still go back to that idea of gentle, and I think that that's what they're trying to ultimately differentiate with. And what they're not telling you is if you try a laxative that isn't gentle, watch out. <laughs> okay, good stuff, Henry. Good stuff, Howard. He's Henry Gomez. <laughs> and he's Howard Eibach. And we blew our outro <laughs> together with the Brief Brothers. Till next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>